I'm Marcy Ravitch, and I'm the director of McPath. We want to welcome you to our clinical conversation this afternoon. Our clinical conversations take place on the fourth Tuesday of each month from 12.15 to 1.15. Today's topic is emerging psychosis, what the primary care practitioner should know. A few housekeeping things before we begin. This session will be recorded and will be available on the MCPAP website at www.mcpap.org. A copy of the PowerPoint slides will be available on the MCPAP website as well in the Archive News and Webinars page under About MCPAP. Our presenters will stop for questions at the end of the presentation. If you have a question or comment, please type into the question box during the presentation and we will read out your question or unmute your line to enable you to ask your question for everyone to hear. You will receive a very brief survey following the presentation. We hope that you will take a moment to complete that as your feedback is really helpful um, for us to improve our future presentations. With that, I'm going to introduce our distinguished presenters for today. We have Dr. Kristen Woodbury, an individual and family clinician with the Cedar Clinic. She is a licensed clinical social worker with a PhD in psychology and over 17 years of clinical experience working with children, adolescents, and families. Her primary focus has been working with adolescents and young adults at risk for or in the early stages of major mental illness. Dr. Woodbury obtained her MSW from Simmons College School of Social Work and her PhD in Clinical Psychology from Harvard University. Next, we have Dr. Larry Seidman. Dr. Seidman is a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist, and his specialization is in psychotherapy and neuropsychological assessment of teenagers and young adults. He is a program advisor to the Cedar Clinic, as well as the director of the Commonwealth Research Center. Sorry about that. Dr. Seidman is a professor of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and at the Massachusetts Mental Health Center Public Psychiatry Division of the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And then we have Dr. Emily Feinberg. I'm sorry. Emily Feinberg, who is a PsyD and certified pediatric nurse practitioner. And um, Emily is an associate professor at Boston University School of Public Health in the Department of Community Health Sciences, as well as an associate professor of pediatrics at Boston University School of Medicine. Professionally, Dr. Feinberg is a pediatric nurse practitioner at Dorchester Multi-Service Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Feinberg received her PsyD and her Master's in Science from Harvard School of Public Health, her MSN in Parent-Child Nursing from Simmons College, and her BSN from Boston University. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to turn it over to our experts now to uh, learn as much as we can in the short time we have available. Thank you very much, uh, Marcy, and welcome to everybody. We're really happy to have the opportunity to speak with you about this topic. Um, as you will often be the first professionals to whom a young person may disclose the early signs of emerging major mental illness, and that's the first person who can help them get help when that may provide the most hope. Um, so please note we are not going to uh, cover everything you should know, but we will try to touch on the highlights, and there are a lot of resources on our website um, and know that McPap and our clinicians are here to help you. So why talk about psychosis and youth? First of all, 50% of mental illnesses begin before the age of 14, 75% before the age of 24. And if we continue the wait and see approach, uh, as in the painting to the right, um, we're gonna continue to pull people out of the river in adulthood whom we might have kept from falling in years earlier. And research shows that the delays from when a young person becomes psychotic to when they receive treatment are longest for those who are under 18, even though we may have the most contact with this group. Um, so we want your help in turning this around. So I'm going to pass things on uh, to Emily. Hi. Um, 
I wanted to give you a little background about myself and how I got interested in this topic and to thank Kristen and Larry for inviting me to participate on the webinar. Uh, as uh, I was introduced, I'm a nurse practitioner at Dorchester House and I also have taught and do re done research at the School of Public Health at BU. And I became interested in the identification of psychosis when I began to develop a course on prevention of mental health disorders. And I, like I imagine most of you, was fascinated to learn that there were effective models of early intervention for psychosis that could include kids' outcomes. I had had patients who developed psychotic disorders, but I had thought that um, it was sort of like they had had a psychotic break, and I didn't realize that there were early warning signs that I, as a primary care provider, could play a role in identifying and potentially altering the course of this disease. And I had reached out to folks at Cedar Clinic to speak in my class, and I had learned a lot from their presentation and also from the uh, Portland's peer program, which I think will be talked about later in the program. But the biggest impact of their presentation was on my clinical practice. And I was really um, just brought a new awareness of trying to identify and do something for kids that I thought might be at risk. So I'd like to tell you a story of a teen who I'm, we'll call Billy. Billy was uh, a 16 year old Vietnamese youth who lived with his mother and sister in Dorchester. He was an incredibly bright kid. Um, had gone through Boston Public School System, always excelled, and was attending a private parochial school on full cost scholarship. And when his initial, when he came in for his routine year check, something just seemed different than how he had been in past visits. He was always somewhat of a quirky kid. He wasn't interested in sort of typical teen uh, activities, had somewhat of a disdain for some of his peers, um, but always had a kind of a small group of, of, of close friends. When he came in at the particular exam that I thought something was amiss, he just seemed uh, to have really little eye contact, very flat affect, and I had a very hard time engaging him in conversation. I thought he was perhaps depressed, and I gave him the PHQ-9 adolescent version, and he scored very high on the depression measures. I um, talked to him uh, about that, and he seemed um, very, you know, kind of very curious about depression and its symptoms and open to medication. And I started him on fluoxetine with uh, weekly follow-up and monitoring his symptoms. But after um, a few weeks of follow-up, and he always came back, which I thought was kind of amazing, um, there was some improvement in his depressive symptoms, but his affect just seemed unusual, and he acknowledged some sort of strange visual experiences. At that point, I... Uh, administered the uh, prodom prodromal questionnaire 16, which is something that had been introduced um, to me by uh, the presentation from the folks at Cedar Clinic. And it was really helpful because it gave me a way to ask and learn about, quest learn about asking about psychotic symptoms in a way that I thought didn't seem um, off-putting to teen or um, seemed just more comfortable as questions to raise within the context of a primary care visit. And when um, I saw how he responded to those questions, I realized that I perhaps was dealing with something more than simple depression. And I called um, the Cedar Clinic, and just to say it was really easy. Um, I had contact with uh, Michelle Jacobian, who's another clinician on the CEDAR team. I left her message, she called me back in like less than a day, and 
talk to me about potentially what options there were, including enrolling in a research study that would be able to monitor Billy's symptoms and sort of provide ongoing care. And um, that's where, that's when folks from the Cedar Clinic became involved. Um, the, the kind of key issues for me and challenges were that one, the, well, Billy was very independent in his care. His mother worked very long hours and didn't accompany him to the visits and was not really, um, it was very hard to get her to come in to a visit with Billy uh, to discuss the research uh, opportunity. And in terms of family values, education was tremendously valued, and there had been a lot of pressure on both Billy and his sister to, to excel, and his mother was very concerned that uh, having being a part of any treatment or research would have long-lasting implications for his educational attainment. The, the thing that worked well was uh, the full involvement of the team at Dorchester House as well as the Cedar folks to um, really monitor and support Billy as well as his school nurse at the uh, school that he was at. And I think my key learnings were you don't really have to know what's, um, you know, whether you think a youth has psychosis or not. Uh, and that was very reassuring to me that the Cedar Clinic folks were there and able to help in what's often a, a more complex assessment that is something that our behavioral health clinicians, which we do have really excellent ones at the health center, um, did not have a lot of experience with. So I'm going to turn it back to Kristen to talk a little bit about um, what happened with the uh, process and the work together with the folks from CEDAR. Hi, Kristen, it's Marcy. Um, we've had a couple questions from folks asking what the CEDAR Clinic is, so perhaps you could start with a little description of what CEDAR stands for and what you actually do there. Yeah, great, and we will definitely get into some specifics of that at the end. Uh, CEDAR stands for the Center for Early Detection and Assessment uh, and Response to Risk. And uh, what we uh, are, it's a really integrated center of research and clinic services, um, clinicians uh, who are working to identify young people at risk for major mental illnesses. And their primary symptom presentation that we're looking for is presentation of psychotic-like symptoms. Uh, but we'll talk about kind of the emergence of symptoms and what it looks like. Um, our uh, you know, interest is in catching things early enough so that we can intervene and improve the outcomes uh, of young people. So uh, hold on to that question and we'll uh, answer more questions uh, after I've had a chance to talk about some specifics. Um, but Emily was really great to work with and I have to say it, we're always thrilled when we hear from primary care offices um, because very often that's a signal that uh, young people are being picked up about as early as we as we can. We couldn't get Billy's mom to come into our offices, but Emily really helped us make uh, a meeting at her office possible. And like Emily described, um, Billy had kind of this persistent oddness, lack of social connectedness, and magical thinking, and blunted affect, all of which are um, concerning early signs of possible emerging uh, schizophrenia. Um, in addition, he talked about an increasing subjective sense that something was off. So in the uh, very careful uh, interview that we do with all the young people who come to our center, um, actually learned that his initial symptoms started when he was five. Um, so very often these are perceptual abnormalities, increased sensitivity to sounds uh, or light. And by age 12, he was seeing brief figures of people or animals and shadows. Um, again, something was catching his imagination with these. Um, they were frightening to him and distressing, and then he started feeling a presence. 
It wasn't until he was 16 that be he began hearing voices. So when people ask, are you hearing voices, um, they are only picking up kind of often late signs. But for him, he started as incoherent, often screaming, but again, very fleeting and intermittent. What was actually more concerning was uh, what he reported in his thinking. So he wondered if others could read his mind. He worried that he was being watched or singled out. Um, thought that his dreams might foreshadow the future. He would dream something and then it would happen in real life. And he had these kind of peculiar thoughts that people have no value unless they're efficient. Um, he declined um, the offer of treatment, but he still had some insight uh, into things not being right. So he wasn't fully psychotic. And over time in the research study, which he participated in very readily, we were able to engage his own concern and worry um, so that he eventually agreed to come in for treatment. And we worked closely with the school-based clinician and the nurse at school and Emily and eventually um, helped him go to college and uh, make contact with clinicians there. So I don't know how Billy's doing now, but um, he was able to successfully graduate from high school and go to college. Um, so important take home for today is we want you to know that we can actually identify young people before they're psychotic who are at imminent risk. So kids with 18 to 36 uh, percent rates of converting to psychotic disorders over the course of three years. But we need your help finding them. So they're not going to present with a sign to let you know what's happening in their minds. Um, they need us to provide safe opportunities for them to share what's going on at a very private level. Up to 75% will not have sought help before a crisis places them in the emergency room or the hospital. And many youth who do seek help seek it from primary care rather than mental health providers. There also seems to be a critical period um, which emphasizes primary care role in recognizing things early. Um, so the greatest deterioration at the level of the brain seems to be in the first two years of psychosis. There's excessive loss of gray matter and excessive synaptic pruning, something that's otherwise normative during adolescence. Um, and then perhaps more importantly, there are significant losses in social and role functioning. So early intervention has the potential not only to relieve suffering and prevent disability or hospitalization and psychosis, um, but it also has um, important value in preventing these kids from um, committing suicide and saying, I don't want to be like Uncle Joe or like what I see in the movies. So let me back up for a minute. When we're talking about psychosis, um, we are primarily talking about positive symptoms, so symptoms that are added on to typical experience. So you know these as hallucinations or delusions or disorganized speech or behavior. But importantly, with the younger population, we're also talking about negative symptoms. So this is the absence of what you expect to be there, the absence of normal affect um, that Emily noticed, or energy or motivation or speech. And these are particularly pronounced in child and adolescent onset psychosis. Um, so the onset can be much more insidious and hard to recognize. So whenever you see these symptoms or positive symptoms, um, this should trigger careful workup for uh, both mental and physical disorders. So the common belief is, like Emily said, psychosis appears suddenly out of the blue um, as this sudden break. But particularly, again, in children, the first signs typically begin months, um, even many years, as in Billy's case, earlier. Um, the earliest changes are often cognitive, particularly attention, learning, organization, processing speed. So these kids may be preferred for an ADHD eval, um, and often at age 10 or 13 or 17, fairly late for that. Possibly in response to some of these cognitive changes or other subtle changes, many young people will become more anxious or down, or you'll start seeing the flattening of affect. 
And one of the best predictors of later psychosis is social withdrawal, um, a loss of initiative, and oftentimes a loss of interest in social connections. Uh, but they become more isolated. And then you may get referrals for dropping grades or failing um, at school. And all of these changes are very common before you see the psychotic-like symptoms um, that Emily picked up in Billy, um, his hearing voices or having more bizarre thought uh, processes. So I'm going to turn things over to uh, Dr. Larry Seidman, who's really an expert in some of the early attentional difficulties, uh, because this is likely to be a particularly tricky differential. Thank you. So just to say very briefly a little bit about myself, I spent maybe two decades uh, working as a clinical neuropsychologist, often seeing teenagers and also doing uh, quite a bit of ADHD research, both neuropsychology and brain imaging. So I have a lot of uh, experience looking at kids with ADHD without psychotic disorders, but um, in our research meetings here over the years and within Cedar Clinic, which, by the way, is, is situated at Massachusetts Mental Health Center in Boston across the street from the Brigham and Women's Hospital, just so you know uh, our location. Uh, very nice space in our nice new building. So I, we hear a lot about attentional problems in kids who are presenting to our high-risk clinic. Uh, or to our research studies. And first of all, they're often coming in saying, my mind's not working, I can't think, I can't study. I read a page that used to take me a minute or two to memorize, but um, now I, I have to do it four or five times and I still don't, don't get it in. So a very common complaint of the youth coming in are problems of attention and concentration. And we notice that in their histories, they're often coming in with the diagnosis of ADHD. And that just raises our question of, um, do they have ADHD? Was that accurately diagnosed? When were they put on stimulants and so on? So I have a few slides which I'll take you through very quickly because we think there are a number of potential risks here for this diagnosis. So first of all, problems in attention are very, very common. And here I list things that are familiar to all of us that will affect anybody uh, on day-to-day -day life, and then extreme circumstances such as severe anxiety, fear, or terror that will interfere with our ability to pay attention, suffering a trauma, um, psychological or physical, and even common medications that we use uh, to treat allergies and, and many others as well as street drugs, and of course stress. So this is just the kinds of factors that may play a role interfering with attention. And so the first question when somebody comes in with attention deficiencies or problems or complaints is, well, we, we need to figure out are there any state effects like now that are affecting? And what about potential disorders? Um, of course, ADHD is going to be one of those questions. But as it turns out, attention dysfunction found in many disorders across the lifespan and certainly in developing disorders of uh, adolescence. And I list here both psychiatric disorders. It could be found also, you know, much more rarely in disorders like petty mal or absence epilepsy. Clearly, if somebody's had a traumatic brain injury playing sports or in a car accident, attention problems are very, very common and then other neurodevelopmental disorders such as autistic spectrum. So it really is a wide range. And one of the first questions is really, when did these attention dysfunctions start? If they began in early childhood, let's say preschool or in elementary school, and there's no other psychotic symptoms, maybe there's comorbid anxiety and depression, then ADHD is very important. But if it and most likely, or more likely, if you can rule out things like autistic spectrum. But if it started in teenage years, closer to the onset of these high-risk symptoms, then you have to wonder whether it's a late developing um, disorder that, that's not ADHD. 
And let's just talk a little bit about what are the neuro char neuropsychological characteristics of the high-risk individuals that we see, and then we'll come back to ADHD. So we're looking at youth beginning age 12 to young adults up to around age 30. And Dr. Woodbury has already described some of the, the attenuated positive symptoms, and I mentioned earlier cognitive impairment. The key issue here is that problems tend to worsen over time in these high-risk disorders. They're not fairly stable as they are in ADHD. And in fact, in ADHD, some kids do grow out of it, you know, perhaps uh, half or less than half or their symptoms diminish. Here the symptoms are getting worse. And as mentioned earlier, problems of attention, the ability to hold things on you know, on, in your mind for a few seconds, somebody tells you something, you have to remember it, then do it, um, and then to retrieve information. These, these areas are very much affected in a kind of perhaps evolving way in the high risk. So even though it looks like ADHD and some of the consequences are similar in terms of problems, social role, with this extra potential psychotic-like piece, features, it's really dealing with a different disorder, probably with an underlyingly different biology. So the key question is, uh, with that biology, um, stimulants, which of course, as you all know, is the first line of, of, of pharmacological treatment of ADHD, uh, it, it turns out that stimulants in, in PET scan studies of teenagers and young adults with, at high risk it's been shown that there's an excess of dopamine at, in the presynaptic pre side of things. So too much stimulation in the dopamine system can actually trigger somebody to develop a psychosis. And we know from people with schizophrenia who are given stimulants that they can get exacerbate their symptoms. Whereas in ADHD, so far the biology suggests that there might be too little dopamine and we also see different genetic um, uh, abnormalities or alterations in the dopamine system in these disorders. So, so stimulants could be a risk factor in actually um, pushing somebody towards psychosis. So really getting a good workup to get the diagnosis accurate is really important. And of course, somebody could have true ADHD and then develop psychosis um, that's not been that well studied, and, uh, but it's, it's, it's certainly possible that they could really coexist. So what, what would be the best thing to do in terms of, you know, from a pediatrician point of view? I would say being cautious in treating kids with attention dysfunctions with stimulants, particularly if you have a later onset and particularly if there's a lot of comorbidity and of course, as, as Dr. Woodbury and Dr. Feinberg have suggested, the, the evaluation of these high-risk symptoms is key. What are some of the other things to look for? Well, if somebody has a family history of ADHD and psychosis in first-degree relatives, that tends to make me worry that their risk is higher because we know family history of schizophrenia elevates your risk about tenfold. Many kids have family history of ADHD without psychosis in the relatives. So that's, that's something that can come up in, a, in an interview. Again, the age of onset, earlier age of onset of attention problems um, preteen makes you more confident that it could be ADHD. Uh, although still, as, as Billy uh, is an example, his symptoms actually began at age five. So one has to look more carefully into this. And I think, you know, seeking, um, uh, as a pediatrician, you may not have as much time to go into all these details. So having an expert in high risk or a consultation, perhaps from a psychologist who's knowledgeable about this, as well as some of the symptoms, um, if somebody's showing increased withdrawal, poor hygiene, odd speech, and, and or family history, that, that should raise your, your index of, of worry. So um, I think that's about all I've got to say about it now. We can take questions later.
So thanks, Larry. <clears throat> so if you remember the diagram of things unfolding, when I talk about attenuated positive symptoms, this is actually fairly late in the emergence, but this is when you may have more of a specific sense that there really is a psychotic process going on. And these are the five uh, symptom categories that we look for. So unusual ideas and delusional beliefs are the precursors of uh, delusions. And this is characterized by kind of wondering if coincidental events actually have some special meaning for them, worrying people might be able to read their minds or put thoughts in their heads, thinking like Billy did that dreams might forecast the future. Suspiciousness, paranoia. Of course, for adolescents, their peers are talking about them behind their backs. Uh, but the, in the early stages, they're often able to recognize that they feel more suspicious than it's warranted. Um, sometimes, however, it takes careful inquiry to tease out what uh, may be justified and what may not be justified. Um, other times, it may be more obvious. So thinking teachers are spreading specific rumors about them or sharing videotapes from class, young people will also report being newly uneasy, having kind of vague fe fears that others are watching or singling them out in some kind of nefarious way. Early forms of grandiosity can involve a vague sense that, might, that you might have the power to, for instance, end terrorism, or they're going to be a great basketball star even though they're not on the basketball team, um, or they don't have to study because they're mysteriously gifted with knowledge, or they're going to write a manifesto. And perceptual abnormalities and hallucinations can actually be fairly common, uh, particularly in children, but also adolescents. Um, and yet, they can also precede hallucinations. So they may complain of overstimulation, um, sounds are too loud, or like Billy, they see shadowy figures, or they may see flashes of light, flame, distortions in faces or objects, um, or they hear the sound of the wind or big sounds mumbling. Um, eventually turning into voices. And finally, disorganized communication, um, and this has to be teased out from kids who have more chronic language deficits, uh, but you may notice some peculiarity in their speech or new errors in their reasoning or hear odd words inserted into sentences. Or the young person may lose track of what they're saying, wander off topic, seem easily derailed, or repeatedly lose their thoughts or feel like their thoughts are actually physically blocked or taken from them. And you may get reports of this from teachers or from parents who are more aware than the young person is. What we're looking for is that something is not right. Um, and typically, we're looking for something that is progressive, so it's new or worsening, rather than just chronic and has been there since very early childhood. On average, kids that we consider at more imminent risk are experiencing symptoms, at least some of them, on a, a roughly weekly basis. Um, but many of them are experiencing these multiple times a day. And we're also looking for something that has impact. So if I think I hear my phone ring, but it's not ringing, I can dismiss that pretty easily. For these young people, it's starting to bother them. They feel like something's wrong. They're closing the shades. They're avoiding certain areas at school or it's interfering in their schoolwork or their ability to socialize with friends. <clears throat> so what are the practice implications in short? We want you to uh, consider psychosis and major mental illnesses when working up all mental health problems. Um, you may be in a unique position to know or get family history of mental illness, which can be an important um, piece of the puzzle. Uh, but pay attention to the sense, like Emily noticed, that there's something more going on than depression, anxiety, attentional difficulties. And we really hope that you will ask about psychotic-like symptoms, um, like you ask about sleep, exercise, school. And when you refer to a behavioral health clinician, whether in your practice or in your community, let them know you're wondering about emerging serious mental illness. This may not be on their radar either. Um, and ask, you can ask for a specific screen, obviously, through McPath or through Cedar. So how to ask? Um, often with the early phases, you're asking more about subtle symptoms. So kids are very concerned what people are going to think. 
or do if they share what's going on. So asking more subtle questions gives them a chance to test the waters and see that you're not shocked or you're not going to overreact. Um, you're, we get a lot of information just from that first question. Have you had the feeling that something odd is going on or something's wrong that you can't? And the second question often elicits information about, you know, video games intruding into real life. Have you ever been confused at times whether something you've experienced is real or imaginary? Do you ever feel like your mind is playing tricks on you? That's what it feels like often in the first early phases. Or if you felt that you're not in control of your own need, ideas and thoughts. And you want to follow up. How do you feel when that happens? What do you do? Tell me more of how you make sense of that. With suspiciousness, persecutory ideas, have you found yourself feeling mistrustful or suspicious of other people? Do you ever feel like you're being singled out or watched? Do you ever feel like you have to pay close attention to what's going on around you in order to feel safe? Um, or you may want to inquire about something they've told you. So what happened that you stopped seeing your friends and follow up on information they've already given you to see if they can tell you a little bit more about what's going on? So mental health assessments often, again, include the question, have you ever heard voices? Um, but again, if they're not hearing voices and they're experiencing other things, they may say no and you've missed an opportunity. So ask about unusual sounds. Or do you hear your own thoughts as if they're spoken outside your head? Or do things you see ever appear different in color, brightness or dullness, or appear changed in some way? Or do you see flashes or shadows? or people or animals or things and then realize they're not really there. So for obviously for any of these experiences, you want to find out if they've happened only under the influence of drugs. Um, and we typically let young people know that hallucinatory experiences occur more often than they know, which is very true, um, particularly in their age range. So normalizing can help them participate in trying to understand their experience. You're trying to get a full picture of what's going on, but you're not trying to quickly put them into a category. Um, and an important clinical aspect of the experience of hallucinations is really the meaning making, the cognitive interpretation of their sensory experience. So finding out how they understand that is actually pretty important to diagnosis. So again, like Emily said, don't feel like you have to be sure of anything to call us. Uh, you will most likely speak with Megan if you call, um, and she can determine if an in-person assessment makes sense, um, if the person's already been what we consider fully psychotic or can't make it into Boston, we'll do our best to help you or them find appropriate services. We can also help provide suggestions on how to talk with either the young person, him or herself, or with parents or a school clinician to help them uh, know how to help someone be ready for help. Um, and if someone is interested and seems appropriate, we'll invite them for an in-person assessment either through the clinic or one of our research studies. Depending on their preferences and appointment av availability, we can often help with transportation if they're participating in research, um, which may be an advantage, especially for people who are a little farther away from Boston. All of our initial assessments involve some degree of specialized structured interview regarding risk for psychosis uh, by a clinician who has rigorous training. Um, often individuals per will participate in a full diagnostic interview, and if the individual and family permits, we will share our impressions with you or with school people or other pr local providers. So as many of you know, um, and probably some of you don't know, but we have a variety of programs, including uh, coming and training your staff, like we uh, worked with um, Emily's class. Um, we also uh, provide assessment, family and patient education and monitoring um, over time. Um, and we have treatment both through treatment trials um, and clinic services. So I'm going to just put a plug in that uh, one of the areas we're most interested in is really addressing early cognitive deficits. So we have some very exciting studies that have kids do exercises that um, we are testing to see if they improve or at least slow down the, the um, decline in cognitive functioning and also, importantly, improve their social skills and their social engagement. 
and we have a study using video games to engage kids who may be more reluctant to do therapy with their families to try to enhance protective factors. Um, so um, there are a number of opportunities and we'll see what people may be most um, amenable to or appropriate for. We see kids uh, ages 12 to 35, I shouldn't say kids, we see young people, um, and uh, age and their clinical presentation are the primary uh, criteria for eligibility, but our, our different programming have different criteria. We will help kind of sort that through either on the phone or when they come in. Um, and uh, when you call, uh, Megan can explain the choices to you and the family to help make uh, understandable. For young people under 12, uh, because you will uh, hear and learn about psychotic symptoms um, in younger age group, um, we can help connect you with providers either in Boston or we'll do our best to help you find uh, appropriate services outside of Boston uh, for that age group. So please give us a call. Uh, I also want to refer you to our website, and we will send out these slides, so you'll have this link as well. Uh, but we have handouts on our um, website uh, specifically helping families understand psychosis or risk for psychosis, um, different kinds of symptoms like lack of motivation or um, having trouble telling what's real from not real and giving them some you know, beginning tips uh, which may be useful for you. Uh, we also have videotapes and uh, recommendations of books that uh, could be helpful for behavioral clinicians. Um, so with that, uh, I think we can move to questions. Thank you, Kristen, Larry, and Emily. That was an excellent uh, overview. We do have a couple of questions. I also want to mention that we have Dr. Barry Sarvet on the line in case there are any questions for a psychiatrist. Dr. Sarvet is our McPap statewide medical director. Um, so the first question is, with this type of early detection, is the psychotic break typically avoided through treatment? Do you want to take? Uh, well, I can I can say something. This is uh, Larry, Larry Seidman. Uh, both Kristen and I have been involved in research on this and familiar with the international literature. There is some evidence uh, that in now five or six meta analyses of roughly 15 studies, mainly psychosocial interventions, but some also involving pharmacotherapy that the rates of transition in, these are, let's say, double-blind or randomized controlled <coughs> trials, um, the rates of transition to psychosis are reduced significantly in the treated, in the group that gets specialized treatment. And um, the follow-ups are generally only for about a year at this point in time, so we don't know whether the, the, the effect is simply delaying a later onset or um, actually it turns out to have really averted a psychosis. Of course, a fair number of people who have these symptoms don't go on to develop psychosis, so at least within a couple of years. So it's a complicated area to study. But the results are actually pretty promising so far. And um, so we're hopeful that this area will grow in research so that we'll have some good, you know, more definitive answers on that kind of question. And, and just for, you know, a figure, it's cutting the risk, the short term, the one-year risk in half. So you're going from transition rates up towards 30 percent, which is um, typically what someone who meets one of our syndromes, um, their risk of conversion and dropping that down to about 10 percent. Great. Thanks. Um, Dr. Sarvet, you have a question? Yes, um, thank you, Marcy. And, and uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, the speakers for a really fantastic presentation. Um, I guess a couple a couple of things. Um, one is that um, that I, I want to talk about about ADHD a little bit because um, I'm sure you 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 must realize that um, pediatricians and pediatric primary care providers treat a lot of patients with ADHD and. And so, so I, I think that um, you know, no one wants to 
to scare them away necessarily because, you know, ADHD continues to be also, you know, a significant public, you know, mental health problem, um, perhaps perhaps overtreated with medication. Um, but but there are lots of kids out there that, that have ADHD who are at risk um, for various outcomes, and, and we don't want to scare people away from treating them. And, and so, so I guess, you know, I, I appreciated the, the points um, that, that were made about the need to, to make sure that you screen patients carefully before launching into ADHD treatment. Um, and, and I actually, I, I really agree fully with, with, with the concern about some of these patients with ADHD who present late um, and, and that, that we have to, it sends up a red flag when you first hear about, you know, attentional issues when they're 12 years old or, or, or later, sometimes as teenagers, sometimes you're concerned about, you know, people wanting performance enhancement, you know, for academic achievement and, and other things. And then there's also issues about diversion, but early, early psychosis is another risk. Um, so, so I think it's just, uh, you know, raising the index of suspicion when you have um, late presentations of, of ADHD and then taking a careful history. Uh, the idea of getting a consultation for any patient who presents with attentional symptoms is, might not be realistic, um, and I actually think that, that PCPs uh, can can go farther than we might think in terms of um, taking a careful history, um, you know, for uh, retrospective uh, histories related to ADHD. So sometimes we just find out late, but they've, you know, had, you know, classic symptoms of ADHD for a long time. And then taking careful family histories, certainly, uh, I think, uh, within the purview of primary care providers to be able to do that, to ask about uh, psychosis, uh, psychotic disorders in the family, and then to ask about um, the different kinds of uh, prodromal symptoms or, or early symptoms that, that you describe, I think, are really important reminders for, for all of us. But I guess I, I did want to comment and, 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 and even ask for your feedback about this notion of um, kind of suggesting that uh, any patient with an attentional problem should should get a psychological assessment or a consultation because I thought that, that that was potentially an implication of, of one of the earlier slides that uh, Dr. Seidman uh, had presented. Right, right. No, I, I agree with your point. I think perhaps what I was thinking there more and maybe good to refine it is really more for these later onset teenage presentations where there isn't good evidence for the childhood onset of the disorder. So, yeah, I, I don't think that in every, certainly pediatricians do a very good job and have a lot on their, on their plate in terms of dealing with kids with attentional problems. So it's not possible for everyone to get a full <clears throat> or even desirable a full neuropsych workup. I think what you know, we're really talking about more of the, the 12 to 18-year-old kids who didn't necessarily have ADHD as kids, or maybe they did have some mild attentional problems, and something has changed and gotten worse. So I think, which is not so typical of, of, of ADHD. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. So I think, yeah, I agree with you, and perhaps that point might have been a little overstated in the slide. So... Uh, I appreciate what you're saying. I sure. think the other, the, the other thing, though, that Kristen and I have seen a lot throughout our experience over the last decade and probably longer is that the psychotic-like symptoms are often not asked about. And I think that's a function that most practitioners in our field, in mental health, as well as, I'm sure, in pediatrics, were not aware that as many as, on average, 7 to 10 percent of, of teenagers may have psychotic-like symptoms, uh, even though they don't all develop psychotic disorders. In other words, the frequency of the symptoms uh, has emerged as higher than people expected from epidemiological studies around the world. And we often find that these items, because they're also harder to ask about, how do you yeah, give yeah. some examples of, well, how do you put it to the parent 
um, in an empathic way to try and get it or the or the teenager who's maybe wanting to tell you something that they haven't told anybody. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I think anyway, that that's really ahead, that's sorry. really helpful, um, Larry. Uh, that's a very helpful. And I, actually, I also wanted to 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 chime in about those questions that Kristen had uh, proposed at the end. I think they're very practical, very very useful for pediatric primary care providers. I, I was going to just add one small point just as a tip to pediatricians that um that 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 sometimes you know as you've mentioned you know adolescents are, and and adults are sometimes reticent to kind of disclose uh these kinds of symptoms and so but but they often do and and if they're asked uh sensitively and and if you try to normalize it uh that that you get a better better yield but another strategy for eliciting this kind of uh history is um that we often have to really talk to to parents and and third parties because a lot of times patients with these symptoms they make they make remarks <laughs> at home and 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 almost always in my experience um with these patients then there's a history prior to the recognition of symptoms uh, by a physician that uh, other family members and people around them have heard people say weird things that that are unexpected and 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 concerning and they kind of overlook them and and they kind of move on and 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 if and if the parents are asked you know have have you know your has your child uh, mentioned um anything that was concerning that seemed uh like an unrealistic uh, thought that seemed like it was um odd odd to you um sometimes you can elicit some history that way too and we will also uh, uh i think uh marcy is going to send out by email the pq16 which is a pretty quick self report that people can hand out to patients Great. Yeah, I was going to ask about that, actually. And could you talk just for a moment about how a practice might use a behavioral health clinician for some of this, um, if they happen to have one working in their practice? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I can start, but you guys may even have a better sense of that. But I think if there's some um, concern about something odd or something that may keep take some time to elicit that uh, the behavioral clinician, behavioral health clinician may be able to take more of the time um, to probe with these subtle, nonspecific kinds of questions um, to try to make it safe for someone to disclose it. And the PQ-16 is a screen. I, you know, I would love to see this given to kids, um, adolescents in particular, but probably you know, 10 years old and on, because a lot of the young people we see, their symptoms started at age 10, uh, many earlier, but that's, um, there's kind of an uptick then. And uh, who who are presenting with anxiety, depression, school problems, just as a, a probe to get some more information and see if there's something else that the kid is not disclosing. So many of these young people have gone years in mental health treatment without anybody asking them about psychotic symptoms. Great, thank you. And that screening tool will also be available on our website under the section marked um, uh, toolkits and screening tools. Um, we have another question. Is CEDAR a first episode clinic or otherwise related to the RAISE study and navigate treatment program? You may have to tell us what those are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, the good, another good question. Cedar is not a first episode clinic, and I'll explain a little bit about that context. It's fairly unique. Essentially, it's the only one, or perhaps there's one other new clinic at MGH that's developing that's really focused on this period before psychosis or where there's just some hints of psychosis. Um, the first episode clinics are clinics where somebody has really already transitioned to a full psychotic disorder where, and Kristen didn't have enough time to go into the details, where there really is a substantial loss of insight and lack of awareness of the, they can't distinguish between the reality and the unreality of certain experiences. Whereas in a high-risk clinic, the person says, you know, I heard a voice, Dr. Seidman. I don't think it's there. It scared me. I looked around. But I know it, it's weird and there's something wrong with my mind. 
as compared to a voice is telling me, you know, to move my right arm. So I did it 15 times. Um, so in the first episode clinics, of which there is one in our institution called the PrEP program, and there are now eight or nine programs around the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, in Boston and out to Western Mass. These programs are part of a growing national effort to do early intervention once the psychotic disorder is clearly established because as in most, if not all medical disorders, we are intervene earlier, we're more likely to get a better outcome and prevent disability and so on. Navigate and raise, those are two terms. There was a national study done called the RAISE study, and that is basically, uh, I forget the exact, what the acronym means exactly, but it's, it was a 30-site study looking at does early intervention work more than treatment as usual for people in the early psychosis phase? And the answer is yes. It's also cost efficient, uh, even though you're putting more services in. And um, particularly if you're trying to reduce what's called the duration of untreated psychosis, that is the period when a person has actually become fully ill but is not getting treatment. That really is critical, and that's another justification for the high-risk program. Uh, navigate is another term for the kind of treatment within RAISE. So it's, you know, probably a little too technical <laughs> to go into, but there are a couple of elements of the RAISE treatment model that are being adopted throughout the country. So hopefully that, that's enough detail. And, and there are a bunch of studies in the literature if somebody wants to um, pursue it. Just it's R-A-I-S-E, um, and if you Google that, you'll RAISE study. For first episode, you'll you'll get some papers. Thank you for that explanation. We're going to unmute Katie Collins, who has her hand up. Katie, oh. go ahead and ask your question. No, sorry, that was actually prior. It, it's been oh. answered. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, oh, we have a. Oh, someone typed in, RAISE is recovery after initial schizophrenia episode. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. So I think that concludes our Q&A. We don't have any more questions. I want to thank our speakers for a fantastic uh, overview of early onset psychosis. I, this is such a tremendous movement forward in, in the field of behavioral health and psychiatry to be able to identify these young people um, early and help them get better uh, before uh, they get really, really sick. And it, it's just, I, I have to say I'm a personal, personally very passionate about this. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us. If you come up with any questions or would like more information, you can certainly email us at mcpap at beaconhealthoptions.com. Um, I just want to remind you about the survey you're going to get, uh, if you would take a moment to fill that out, and that our recording will be available on the website, and all the resources mentioned today will be available on our website. And to remind you that we will be having our next clinical conversation on March 28th at 12.15. And the focus next month will be on resource and referral and care coordination in the primary care setting. So thanks, everyone, for joining us, and have a great day. Thanks, Marcy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.